Well, turn with me in your Bibles uh, again to 2 Samuel chapter 13. Um, So Eric read the first portion of this chapter, a really dark portion really about uh, Amnon's sin in relation to Tamar, and then we'll pick up a little bit later uh, in verse 23. So Samuel th- uh, 2 Samuel 13, 23. So after two full years, two years after uh, Amnon and Tamar, Absalom had sheep shearers at Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's sons. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold, your servant has sheep shearers. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go, lest we be burdensome to you. He pressed him, but he would not go, but gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said to him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom pressed him until he let Amnon and all the king's son go with him. Then Absalom commanded his servants, and he said, Mark when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. And when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not fear. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. So the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and each mounted his mule and fled. Now following this, uh, Absalom has just murdered his brother Amnon, and he flees to the land of Geshur. Joab comes up with a plan to bring Absalom back, and hires a wise woman who tells a tale uh, made to prick David's conscience. And then we'll pick up just after that in 2 Samuel 14 and verse 21. Then the king said to Joab, Behold now, I grant you this. Go, bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell on his face to the ground and paid homage and blessed the king. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord the king. And that the king has granted the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, let him dwell apart in his own house. He is not to come into my presence. So Absalom lived apart in his own house and did not come into the king's presence. Now in all Israel, there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, There was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, for at the end of every year he used to cut it, when it was heavy on him he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head, 200 shekels by the king's weight. There were born to Absalom three sons and one daughter, whose name was Tamar. She was a beautiful woman. So Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem without coming into the king's presence. Then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king. But Joab would not come to him. So he sent a second time, but Joab would not come. Then he said to his servants, See, Joab's field is next to mine, and he is barley there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab arose and went to Absalom at his house and said to him, Why have your servants set my field on fire? Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I sent word to you, come here that I may send you to the king to ask, why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me to be there still. Now therefore let me go into the presence of the king, and if there is guilt in me, let him put me to death. Then Joab went to the king and told him, and he summoned Absalom. So he came to the king and bowed himself on uh, on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed, kissed Absalom. Uh, Will you pray with me now? Lord God Almighty, we do thank you, Lord, that your word has power, that your word has the power by your Holy Spirit uh, to change us. 
to make us more like Jesus, to expose our sins and to draw us ever nearer to our Savior in head, heart, and hands. And so, Lord, we pray that now as we consider your word, that you would shed light, that you would give us understanding, that our lives would be changed, and that your name would be glorified. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this passage before us, chapters 13 and 14, are really quite something. I haven't seen it, but I somewhat suspect this is how an episode of Shortland Street would play out. Uh, You've got beautiful women, handsome men with long locks. Uh, You've got desire. You've got hurt. You've got revenge, you've got plots, you've got deception, you've got plans within plans. On one level, these chapters that we've just read and the events described are probably, hopefully, outside of our experience. But on another level, they're actually strikingly relatable to us. Because what we've got in these chapters is really a family broken and damaged by sin. We've got one son who does something incredibly stupid and harmful. We've got another son who holds on to a grudge and takes revenge. And we've got a dad who is disappointingly passive and then cold and distant. Doesn't that sound relatable? Right, families are tricky. Almost every every family has some skeletons in the closet and often an elephant or two in the room. Uh, There is fault lines of fragility and brokenness, and children, to their parents' sadness, uh, often make stupid decisions that can end up harming themselves and others. Parents are often not the mums and the dads that they should be. So while the details of these chapters might be extreme, the world that these chapters describe is our world. And the experience is sadly one that we can relate to. So rather woodenly, there is really three movements to this chapter. Amnon takes Tamar. Absalom kills Amnon. And then David brings Absalom back. So firstly, we've got Amon takes Tamar. So chapter 13, if you look down, starts in a way that is eerily similar to chapter 11 are with a beautiful woman and a lustful man. But the person in view is not King David, but instead his firstborn son and the crown prince, Amnon. And Amnon is literally sick with desire for his half-sister, Tamar. He's obsessed with her. He can't stop thinking about her. He's infatuated. In verse 4, he calls it love. But as we'll come to see, it's not love, but lust. Love serves, lust takes. Love does things for people, lust does things to people. So Amnon is tormented by this obsession. He's not eating or drinking. He's haggard in his appearance. And along comes his cousin, Jonadab. And Jonadab is a very clever man. He's not a particularly principled man, but he is a very clever man. And so when he hears of Amnon's plight, he comes up with a plan. What's the plan? Pretend to be sick. When dad, aka David, inquires, convince him you need your sister Tamar to come and tend to you. And David falls for it hook, line, and sinker. The impression that we get of Tamar is really of one of innocent vulnerability. She doesn't seem to suspect a thing until until Amnon's hands lock onto her wrists. You can almost feel her terror and horror as you read verses 12 and 13. Don't do this. It's unheard of among God's people. You'll ruin my life. Right, in these days, if you weren't a virgin, you were usually effectively sentenced to solitude and shame. 
but none of it moves Amnon in the least. His heart, just like David's before him, has been hardened like cement. Lust now sits in the driver's seat and calls the shots. David took Bathsheba by means of political power. Now Amnon takes Tamar by means of physical strength. It's dark and it's horrible. And as is often the case, lust gives way to hatred and despising. He's ruined her life. Now he says, get up, get out. He instructs his servant, and if you look at verse 17, uh, the word woman isn't actually present in the original language. It's literally, get this out of my presence. Right, like a piece of garbage. Used, disputed. Used, abused, and now tossed out. You see, lust doesn't see people as creatures of God made with dignity and worth, but instead it sees them as objects to be used and then thrown away. So Tamar flees the house, tears running down her cheeks, her life and her future now in tatters. But perhaps most shockingly of all, nothing is done about it. This is a fragrant breaking of God's explicit law in Leviticus 18. It is a crime punishable by death. God's law has been broken, a life has been ruined, but nothing is done about it. David is furious, but he does nothing. Absalom is seething with hatred, but initially he too does nothing. Why does God give us passages like this? Passages which are dark, which deal with seedy people. He doesn't give it to us merely to entertain us. Why does he give us passages like this? Well, at least in part, God gave us this passage so that we could see that the word of God addresses our world. That actually the Bible is not a fairy tale dealing with Prince Charming, a country far, far away and happily ever after. But instead the Bible deals with our world, a world in which sometimes people do terrible things and sometimes people have terrible things done to them. You see, the Word of God speaks into our world and our experience with all of its grittiness. It's also a warning to us of sin, and particularly of lust. Lust takes, objectifies, and destroys. It's never a victimless crime, but actually, just like we saw with David, lust given free reign always leads to a trail of brokenness and misery. It's a disease which we as believers have to be ever watchful against and pray earnestly. To brothers and sisters, be on guard. Show lust no mercy in your life. Lean heavily on the Holy Spirit and don't give it an inch. In photography, as many of you I'm sure will be aware, you've got what's called a photo negative. And in a photo negative, the areas of the photo that are normally light are now dark. And the areas of the photos that are normally dark are now light. Right? It's an inversion. It's like the exact opposite of what's really there. And in some ways, these chapters before us act like a photo negative. They're an inversion. We get to see not what Jesus is like, but actually what Jesus is not like. You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus is not like Amnon. He does not use, abuse, and dispose of the vulnerable. You see, unlike Amnon, Jesus protects the weak and protects the vulnerable. If you're a Christian, you are safe with Jesus. So firstly, Amnon takes Tamar. Secondly, Absalom murders Amnon. So our passage continues. Two years have elapsed. The kingdom goes on, life goes on. It seems to be a thing of the past. But at least one person has not forgotten or let it go. And that is Absalom, David's uh, third-born and Tamar's brother. 
Well, on the outside, Absalom has put on a good face. On the inside, he has been nurturing the smoldering coals of bitterness and hatred, playing the long game. Now it was a time when sheep shearers would have a special sheep shearing celebration. And so Absalom invites his father David to join, knowing full well that David wouldn't be able to. And so Absalom appears to switch tracks. Well, if you can't go, uh, what about Amnon, say? And on the surface, it kind of seems to make sense. Amnon is the crown prince, the firstborn. But David, I suspect, kind of suspected something. You can almost imagine David pausing. And then he says, why should he go with you? David hasn't forgotten. But Absalom manages to convince him. Just as David deceived Uriah, so now Absalom deceives David. The cheese is out, the trap is set. And the plan? Wait till Amnon is drunk and unable to either defend himself or escape, and then strike him down. The plan goes off like clockwork, without a hitch. David got Uriah drunk and then murdered him. Now Absalom gets Amnon drunk and then murders him. Word gets back to David and his heart breaks. He thinks all of his sons have been murdered in an instant. But then once again, slippery Jonadab pops up right at the opportune moment. And really what he goes on to say makes us suspect that Jonadab was in the know. In fact, just like he set up the plan with Amnon, it's altogether possible he set up this plan also. Jonadab is a slippery political creature. His only loyalty is to himself. He goes where the winds of success blow. So David killed Uriah and Bathsheba mourned. Now Absalom kills Amnon and David's mourns. And so, da and so Absalom flees to Geshur. Now you, if you look down at verse 39 and then verse 14.1, you could really read these two verses in two different ways. Either you could read it as David mourns for Absalom and is happy that Amnon is dead. Right, that's the way the ESV goes, that's the way many Bible translation goes. Or the second way you could read it is that David mourns for Amnon and is angry at Absalom. Now that's the way that most of the Bible commentators go. So if you look at verse 39 up there, uh, one way it could be translated is that, and King David ceased to go out to Absalom, i.e. ceased trying to hunt him down, for he was consoling himself about Amnon that he had died. David is in mourning. And then in verse 14, uh, chapter 14 and verse 1, it could be translated as now Joab the son of Zariah knew that the king's heart was not for Absalom, but against Absalom. Now, it's hard to be sure, but this other way of reading it does make kind of sense. Right? It's understandable that David would be angry. One of his sons has just murdered another son. Not only so, but he's just deceived David and made him an accomplice. It would also make sense of why David has to be tricked into bringing Absalom back and why when Absalom does get brought back, David keeps him at arm's length. Anyway, something for you to think about. So if the first half of chapter 13 was a warning against lust, the second half is a warning against harboring bitterness and taking revenge. Amnon's sin was a distortion of desire. Absalom's sin was a distortion of justice. And in light of the latter chapters, we're left wondering just how much Absalom did this for Tamar and how much he did it to get rid of an obstacle between him and the throne. You see, church, Jesus isn't like Absalom. He isn't ruled with bitterness, envy, personal ambition. He doesn't deceive, plot, and murder. Unlike Absalom, Jesus is willing to forgive even the worst of crimes. And finally, in chapter 14, David brings Absalom back. So Absalom has been in exile in Geshur for three years now. 
depending on how you read it, David is either sad that his son is away or still less than impressed with Absalom. But either way, Joab knows this is not a good situation, not personally and not for the kingdom. Absalom is the crown prince now. His place should be at David's side. So Joab hatches up a plot. He looks in the directory for a renter wise woman, and he finds one from Tekoa at an affordable price. And this woman is quite the actress, real Broadway material. And she comes to David with a sad tale of woe. Uh, she is a widow with two sons. Just like Cain and Abel, one of the sons has killed the other son. And the community now wants to take the surviving son and put him to death for his crimes. It was right in a sense, it would have been just, but it would leave her all alone with no one to care for her. So David is moved. He steps in. He will protect her and protect the son. Family matters. Blood runs thicker than water. But then comes the gotcha moment, similar in some ways to Nathan's gotcha moment back in chapter 12. How can you say, David, mercy for the remaining son when you won't show mercy to your remaining son? That sounds an awful lot like double standards, David. Right? This woman certainly had guts to her. And she throws in a little bit of flattery for good measure. If you look at verse 17 and 20, she says, you're like an angel of God and wisdom and discernment, which is certainly ironic, as David has now been tricked and deceived, first by Amnon, then by Absalom, and finally by this wise woman herself. Well, by this point, David smells a rat, and rightly, he corrects Joab. But David has been convinced, so he brings Absalom home. And Absalom comes back, and in verse 25 through 27, you get your first description of Absalom. And if you look down at those verses, they're actually a description that sounds ominously like Saul, outwardly impressive. He's handsome as anything, Prince Charming. He has luscious locks. He is, admittedly, a little bit of a narcissist. I mean, who weighs their hair every year? If you do, stop it. <laughs> However, Absalom may be back, but he's not really back. Jerusalem, yes. Palace, no. He tries to talk to Joab about it, but no joy. So he takes more extreme measures and sets Joab's field on fire. If you're trying to get hold of your neighbor and they're a little bit elusive, just set their front lawn on fire. It works a treat every time. So the passage ends with a little bit of a form of reconciliation, but the drama is far from over as we'll see next week. Mr. Luscious Locks still has a few tricks up his sleeve. Now as I've worked through these chapters, I've tried to deliberately show how similar they are to chapters 11 and 12 in the case of David and Bathsheba. But just to make it absolutely explicit, uh, you can see it up here. In chapters 11 and 12, David lusts inappropriately after a beautiful woman, forcefully takes her, deceives Uriah, gets him drunk and then kills him, and then is convicted through a story. In chapters 13 and 14, Amnon lusts inappropriately after a beautiful woman, forcefully takes her. Absalom then deceives David and Amnon, gets Amnon drunk and kills him, and then David is again convicted through a story. It's quite striking when you see it like that, isn't it? What's the point? Well, the point is that David is experiencing here what he has just inflicted upon Bathsheba and Uriah. He took Bathsheba, now his son takes one of his daughters. He deceived Uriah, now he is deceived, first by Amnon, then by Absalom. He got Uriah drunk and murdered him, now Absalom gets his son drunk and murders him. 
Bathsheba's life and family were torn apart by David's sin. Now his family and his life are torn apart by the sins of his children. It's exactly what God said would happen back in chapter 12. In chapter 12, God said to David, because of your sin, the sword will never depart from your house. I'll cause evil to rise up against you from your own house. And that's exactly what's playing out here. David is seeing the mirror image of his own actions, and it's not pretty. So why is God doing it like this? Is it just retribution? Right, David, have a taste of your own medicine. And the answer is that no, it's not retribution, but instead it's discipline. Our God is disciplining David here. And he's disciplining him precisely because he loves him. Uh, we sometimes tell our children, uh, we're telling you off and we're disciplining you because we care for you. Uh, because we love you and we want you to be who God created you to be. Now, to be fair, they often don't appreciate the sentiment at the time, but it is true. And similarly, actually, the Lord loves us enough that sometimes he'll discipline us. And actually experiencing the Lord's discipline is an indication that you're one of God's children. Sometimes like David here, God allows us to see our sin reflected in the lives of our children. That actually you begin to see ways that your children resemble you or have learned things from you. As many parents here will be able to attest, there are a few things as humbling as seeing your own sins play out in the lives of your children. Other times, God might cause your sin to catch up with you, and you have to face the consequences, maybe the hurt that you've caused others, maybe the effect that your sins have on your body. But for the Christian, we need to know that it's discipline, not retribution, and that actually it's done in love. You see, we see ourselves as we currently are, but God sees us as what we could be, as what we one day will be, and, and as he designed us to be. It's a little bit like kind of the wholesale renovation of a house. Walls will need to be ripped out. Carpets will need to be pulled up. Whole sections will need to be redone. The end result will be stunning. But it's not a comfortable process. So Jesus is not like Amnon. He doesn't use, abuse, and dispose of the vulnerable. Jesus isn't like Absalom. He is not ruled by bitterness, revenge, and personal ambition. And Jesus is not like David here. He isn't passive when he should be active. He doesn't hold our sins over our heads. He doesn't keep us at arm's length, and he doesn't need to be prodded and tricked into receiving us back but instead he is quick to restore love and forgive. So friends, Jesus is not like Ab Amnon. Jesus is not like Absalom, and Jesus is not like David here. And actually, even his very discipline is done in love. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we do thank you that you are a good God and that all of your ways are good. Our Lord, we thank you that in your grace, you discipline those that you love. And that, Lord, just like David experienced here, that we too, from our own lives, can attest, Lord, that while discipline is hard and uncomfortable, that it is often exactly what we need. Our Lord, so we thank you that you love us too much to let us remain comfortable in our sins. Thank you, Lord, that you take care of us and thank you, Lord, that with you we are ever safe and ever secure. And we pray all this in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.